How much do we truly understand about the people who lived before us? The answer to that question is, not as much as we'd like to think we do. Don't believe us? That's fine. Make yourself comfortable and we'll prove it to you with the mysterious ancient artifacts in this video. During the 15th century, there was a king of Texcoco called Netzhualcoyotl Alcomitzli Yoyonsen, who was known as both a poet and a warrior. He was clearly a man of elaborate tastes. Between 1453 and 1460, he oversaw the creation of the huge baths and exotic gardens that exist on the slopes of Tezcuzingo. In its prime, this was a place of palaces, temples, altars, and outdoor swimming pools fed by aqueducts that brought water from several miles away in the Sierra Nevada. This is easily the most advanced and accomplished pre-Spanic work of hydraulic engineering in Mexico. Even after the king was gone, the baths and gardens were considered sacred, so much so that in 1539, the first Archbishop of Mexico ordered the destruction of the reliefs inside the palace complex because he feared they were being worshipped as false idols. Like every other ancient Mexican site, it was attacked and damaged by the Spanish in the 16th century, but still retains much of its original beauty. Vegetation grows here during the rainy season and offers visitors a hint of how beautiful the gardens must once have been. The county of Essex in the United Kingdom isn't the sort of place you'd expect an ancient Egyptian sarcophagus to be discovered, which makes this next tale all the stranger. The unlikely discovery of the artifact was described by the British press as an Indiana Jones moment when it happened in August 2014. Stephen Drake, an auctioneer, had been called to a house clearance in Bradwell-on-Sea to see if there was anything of value inside it. The last thing he expected to see was a genuine 3,000-year-old Egyptian sarcophagus propped up in a corner and gathering dust. The owner of the house had passed away thus prompting the clearance, and their relatives said it had never been mentioned to them, and they had no idea where it might have come from. The sarcophagus isn't in great condition, and so it's thus far proved to be impossible to identify its owner. If there was ever an inscription on the casket, it's long since been weathered away. The strangest thing about this find is that there's no record of the sarcophagus entering the UK, raising the possibility that it may have been smuggled in on the black market. The purpose and authorship of the Fool's Cap map of the world is a mystery that united historians and cartographers. Who created this bizarre 16th century drawing, based on the body and costume of a court jester, but with a map of the world as a face? The copper plate engraving was made somewhere between 1580 and 1590, possibly based on a slightly earlier drawing by French cartographer Jean de Formont. The name of mapmaker Orance Fine is inscribed in one of the drawing's corners, but it can't be his work. He died in 1555. As the fool was a subject of ridicule, dressing the whole world up in a fool's outfit could be interpreted as a rejection of the political status quo, or even a rejection of the whole world as it existed at the time. That theory is supported by the depressing Latin inscriptions on the foot's medallions, which include Oh the World and Its Worries and All is Vanity. The last quote, right at the bottom of the copper plate, says, The number of fools is infinite. It sounds like the people of the 16th century were just as world-weary as the people of the 21st. In 2016, art experts and historians claimed to have solved what was once described as the world's biggest small mystery. Their claim relates to a 500-year-old set of boxwood miniature carvings that have long confounded academics and scholars. The representations of heaven, hell, and life on earth carved in intricate detail on the artifacts are as confusing as they are impressive. They were the must-have item of their era. King Henry VIII of England carried one around everywhere, which led to them becoming seen as a status symbol. They appear to have been cherished for around 20 years, and then they disappeared from history. There are no contemporary records of who made them or how. 
We can even recreate them using modern methods. 30 of them were studied by New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2016, revealing that each of the pieces was created by making a circular piece of boxwood, bisecting it, slicing it into thin disks, carving the disks, and then reassembling them so neatly that the seams are invisible. The wood comes from Belgium, and amazingly, all of the work on every piece appears to have been carried out by the same person. When that person died, nobody could take over the work, thus explaining their sudden disappearance. The tradition of handing out medals for significant military achievements goes back a very long way. It's just that the medals that were handed out more than 1,000 years ago didn't look like the medals of today. As proof of that, here's a 1,800-year-old military medal that was found in the ancient Turkish city of Per Adiyaman in early October 2022. The medal is notable not just because of its age, but also because of the shape it takes. It's been carved into the shape of the mythical ancient Greek gorgon Medusa. Legend has it that anyone who gazed upon the gorgon would instantly be turned to stone, which makes her an unlikely candidate to become the face of a medal. However, there's a method to this madness. The word Medusa meant guardian in the ancient Greek language, so Medusa often appears as a protective presence in the art of the era. A Medusa medal could be seen as a sort of protective amulet. Historians think it likely that this artifact was given to a soldier for their success in guarding a person or a place from an enemy attack, but can't yet be any more specific than that. During the Renaissance, almost everything could be turned into art. The proof is here in these beautiful knives, all of which have musical scores engraved on their blades. They're Italian in origin and are known as notation knives. The songs and music engraved into them are partitions of Latin religious songs. Some of the best examples of the artifacts can be found on display within the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, England. Each knife has its own score, corresponding to an individual voice within a choir that can be formed by putting all the blades together. It's thought that during the 16th century, people would gather at feasts and then sing the score on their knives, with each of the dinner guests becoming a member of the choir. The artifacts are large and sharp, which might mean that they were used purely for slicing off cuts of meat, rather than eating with them. In January 2021, members of England's Royal College of Music came together to record the music as per the directions on the blades. The resulting song isn't exactly likely to top the charts, but it's a fascinating echo of what dinner parties may have sounded like hundreds of years ago. The most famous artifact that was discovered in the tomb of Tutankhamun when it was opened by Howard Carter in 1922 was the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun himself, along with his iconic golden death mask. Beyond that, some of the artifacts gathered from the tomb are more famous than others. As an example, you might never have heard of Tutankhamun's war trumpets. Three of the musical instruments were recovered from the tomb by Carter, two made of silver and one of bronze. They've been identified as war trumpets because of the military scenes carved into their surfaces. Despite being 3,000 years old, the trumpets are in remarkably good condition. However, some people believe them to be cursed. The first time anyone was permitted to blow into one of the trumpets after they were removed from the tomb was in 1939, shortly after which the Second World War broke out. The trumpets were also blown just before the beginning of the First Gulf War, and again a week before the Egyptian uprising of 2011. Given the state of the world at the moment, perhaps it's best if nobody ever tries to play them again. Were the first immigrants to America members of a long-lost Israelite tribe? That's what the so-called Newark Holy Stones imply, and those who believe the stones are genuine take the suggestion very seriously. An archaeologist called David Wyrick allegedly discovered the artifacts inside ancient Native American burial mounds near Newark, Ohio in 1860. He discovered the keystone, the Decalogue, and a stone bowl in that order. The Johnson Humrick House Museum in Ohio now has all three items. The Newark Earthworks, where the disputed objects were discovered, 
were built by the Hopewell culture upwards of 1,500 years ago, according to popular belief. The Hebrew inscription on the keystone, which includes terms like Holy of Holies, seems incongruous. A tiny Hebrew inscription of the Ten Commandments was later found inside the Decalogue. We should note that Weirich was a proponent of the theory that America was founded by a lost tribe of Israel long before he apparently discovered this evidence, and that the Hebrew used in the inscriptions is contemporary rather than ancient. It's probably a ruse perpetuated by Weirich, and not a particularly cunning one at that. Why did the ancient inhabitants of Mesopotamia create so many clay balls? That's a mystery that scientists and historians have been attempting to get to the bottom of for decades. The question has been the subject of an ongoing study since 2013, but no conclusions have been drawn yet. Most of the balls are at least 5,500 years old, and the most tantalizing theory about their purpose is that they might be the world's oldest data storage system. The first set of ancient Mesopotamian clay balls was found in western Iran during the late 1960s. The smallest of them are roughly the same size as a golf ball, whereas the largest are more like basketballs. Just over 150 have been found to date. Their purpose remained a mystery until technology advanced to the point where we could peek inside the balls without breaking them open by using scanners and 3D modeling. We now know that each ball contains tokens made up of various different geometric shapes. It's possible that these tokens represent encoded information, perhaps recording the value of a trade or the number of goods involved in an exchange. We'd only be able to prove this if we had a cipher to crack the code with, though, and no such cipher has ever been found. All cults and religions have their own sacred symbols and sacred items, and we're usually able to decipher the meaning of most of them. The purpose of the Hand of Sabazios remains a mystery, though. In fact, it represents the only piece of evidence that the cult of Sabazios, once thought to be a myth, ever existed at all. The cult existed across civilizations in the ancient world, with both Romans and Greeks becoming members as long ago as the 3rd century CE. Instead of being a unique system of beliefs, Sabazios' worshippers borrowed elements from several other religions of the time, including the Far Eastern concept of an afterlife. Followers of the cult occasionally wore these solid bronze hands, but some examples show signs of once being mounted on poles, perhaps for marches or demonstrations. Sabazios was a god of both fertility and vegetation, with the fertility aspect perhaps explaining why there are so many snake symbols on the hands we've discovered. Although we've found the hands, we've never found a single temple devoted to Sabazios, so it's possible that the cult who followed the deity met in secret. If you've studied religion, you'll already know that when Muslims perform their daily prayers, they do so in the direction of Mecca. That's led to the common misconception that Muslims pray toward Mecca. They don't. They pray toward the Kaaba building in Mecca, also known as the House of Allah. Of all the legends and tales that surround the Kaaba, those that pertain to the black stone in the easternmost corner are the most mystical. According to the Islamic faith, the stone is black because when Adam entered heaven, the stone soaked up all of his earthly sins to make him pure. It's perhaps more likely that it's turned black because it's been kissed and touched by millions of Muslims during a pilgrimage, who do so because they believe that the Prophet Muhammad once kissed it. The truth behind the myths could be obtained by removing all or part of the stone to study it in a laboratory. But that's out of the question. Like so much about this 4,000-year-old building, the truth will probably never be known. Of all the materials you could make a sculpture from, obsidian is one of the worst choices. It's incredibly hard, which makes it difficult to carve in shape. Nevertheless, someone living in the ancient Aztec city of Texcoco decided to use it to make this monkey jar several centuries ago. It's now one of the most cherished exhibits at Mexico's National Anthropology Museum. To produce it, this ancient sculptor probably used knives to cut out the shape and then polished the surface with sand to give it its distinctive shine. 
The Olmec were occasionally known to do this some 2,500 years ago. We probably know how it was made, but we don't know why. Presumably, the labor would have been expensive, so it's reasonable to assume that it was made for someone who had wealth, power, or both. Some archaeologists believe it might have been used in funeral rites, but archaeologists sometimes have an unfortunate habit of saying that about anything they don't truly know the purpose of. It might have been nothing more than a decorative jar, albeit a very unique one. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.